Today, we're going to demonstrate specific cases in hospitals where IDF has made significant improvements in the outcomes of patients, families, staff, and yes, financially for hospitals. After today, you'll be able to report specific outcomes and data to your team by demonstrating significant benefits for implementing IDF. In addition, after the webinar, as I mentioned, you'll also receive a complete list of references supported by other researchers on further supporting benefits. So our, objective, our objectives today are that you'll be able to describe at least three benefits of unit-wide education of infant-driven feeding, list the steps in a PDSA cycle for creating a QI project, and describe at least two recent QI studies integrating IDEA. So I want to save most of the time for our presenters, although if you are unfamiliar with the IDF program, let me just take a brief moment to explain it. So Infant Driven Feeding, or IDF, is an online educational program developed specifically as a unit-wide rollout to encourage a culture change throughout your NICU from quantity to quality-based feeding practices. It is an online learning program for everyone. It has a neurodevelopmental foundation. It identifies process, processes, includes families, is all types of feeding, breast or bottle. It has a component on systems change, and a unit-wide purchase includes implementation. So more on specifics of IDF after the presentation, but let's get started with our speakers. I'm just going to introduce them really quick. I'll introduce them all at once, and then each one will have their presentation. So Shelly Frisco has worked as a staff nurse for over 20 years at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Hospital Level 4 NICU, and this past received her DNP at Rush University. Not only is she an active member of many nursing organizations, but also committees such as A1's Educational Advisory and Public Policy Committees, the Neonatal Developmental Care Committee, and Perinatal and Neonatal Health Equity Committee. Shelly is passionate about neonatal developmental care family integrated care, perinatal and neonatal health disparity elimination, and health equity. Amanda Geringer is a registered nurse at the Level 4 NICU at Sanford Children's Hospital in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. She has been working as a staff nurse in the NICU for nine years and chairs the NICU Performance Improvement Committee. As principal investigator chair, she helped compile data for the study and presented it as a PI project for Sanford's Project Improvement Symposium. And her project, this project even won in the, in the cost category. She also is a certified breastfeeding counselor and spends 300 to 500 hours a year precepting new nurses. She lives in rural Iowa with her husband, Jason, and two young children. And our last presenter will be Renee Bloom. Renee began her career as a PICU nurse, then transitioned into NICU roles where she has worked for over 24 years. She currently works at Inova Fair Oaks Hospital, where she established and became the inaugural chair for the Developmental chair Care Committee. She's also a member of the Inova Research Council. Renee is currently an RN4 and was promoted to a NICU unit supervisor in 2018. She spearheaded her hospital's infant-driven feeding research study, which is the first known longitudinal study on this topic. Inova Fair Oaks NICU launched the infant-driven feeding program in 2016 and became the first hospital in the nation designated as an infant-driven feeding certified NICU through Dr. Brown's Medical. Renee also has a great passion for medical missions and has been part of a pediatric medical team since 2013 that works in Haiti. So let's begin with Shelly. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to Dr. Brown's Medical for this wonderful opportunity to talk about my unit's implementation of the evidence-based infant-driven feeding practice. I have no disclosures to make. Why did we need infant-driven feeding in our level four NICU? Well, we already know from the literature and from the data that preterm infants have physiological immaturity, and this physiological immaturity often leads them to have feeding difficulties even at term equivalent corrected gestational age. We also know that they are delayed in achieving feeding independency and this delay in achieving feeding independency often leads to prolonged length of hospital stay. 
It is also well documented that adverse and stressful feeding experiences can cause negative effects for our preterm infants well beyond hospital discharge. What is the significance of adverse feeding experiences? Well, our level four NICU was on what's considered a volume driven feeding regimen. And we know from the literature that volume driven feedings are associated with increased stress on infants. Volume driven feedings fail to consider preterm infants physiologic maturity and, and feeding skills. They slow the progression to successful full oral feedings. And unfortunately, the volume driven feeding culture causes increased pressure on bedside caregivers to discharge newborns without a developmentally supportive feeding approach. The significance of adverse feeding experiences for our premature infants in our NICU led to a current practice of initiating volume-driven PO feeding per cues for infants who are 33 weeks postmenstrual age and above. Unfortunately, the problem with this feeding regimen is that it is not individualized specifically for the neurodevelopmental needs of growing premature infants. And we also saw that we had an extended length of stay for our patients within this patient population that was four days above the local benchmark length of stay uh, for our California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative. The purpose for our unit to implement Dr. Brown's Medical's Infant Driven Feeding Program was to improve the experience of our infants learning to feed in our unit by implementing an evidence-based feeding practice approach. Our patient objectives for this implementation was, were simple. We wanted to safely transition the unit feeding practice to best evidence. We wanted to support bedside caregivers and the new feeding practice methods. We wanted to decrease our length of stay by at least two days for our patients who were 33 weeks gestational age and older. Our process objectives for implementing IDF were that we provided all of our bedside caregivers with formalized education of evidence-based feeding practice within a six month timeframe prior to implementing infant-driven feeding. We also provided parent education on the infant-driven feeding practice. And we had a weekly review of nursing documentation for the infant-driven feeding assessments. Our short-term project objectives were that our pilot infant would demonstrate safe feeding quality and adequate nutritional intake within the project's first two weeks. We also wanted to accomplish parental education on infant oral feeding readiness as evidence-based practice documentation in our parent education record. And we wanted to decrease our length of stay by at least two days within one month of our pilot implementation. The long-term objectives for this project were that we would decrease our length of stay for infants feeding with the infant driven feeding method by at least four days within three months of implementing the, the new practice. We wanted to see all infants at 33 weeks gestational age and above who met the criteria for infant driven feeding that they would be fed with the IDF model within six months of implementing IDF. We wanted the feeding practice surveys that we distributed to our bedside care caregivers to indicate a positive improvement in the feeding culture for infant driven feeding within three months of implementing it. And we wanted to see infant driven feeding practice education included with all of our other annual competencies for all of our bedside caregivers. So <clears throat> our level four NICU is part of Mattel Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, California. We are a 22 bed level four NICU with an on-site ECMO program, congenital cardiac program, and a head body cooling program. We are magnet certified. We are also designated breastfeeding baby friendly, and we are a major referral center for high risk mothers and newborns. We have an interdisciplinary team that includes 13 primary rotating neonatologists, approximately 108 registered nurses. 10 neonatal nurse practitioners, rotating neonatal fellows and residents, two lactation consultants, two occ three occupational therapists, three physical therapists, two discharge coordinators, two social workers, a registered dietitian, and our unit nursing director and two assistant directors. 
the framework that we used to guide implementing the infant driven feeding model was the plan do study act model which is shorthand for testing planning or testing a change or observation and we began with one neonate including the plan for collecting data we tried uh, the idf implementation out on a small scale with just this one patient for two weeks and we set aside time to analyze the data and results from implementing infant-driven feeding with this one patient. And then we refined the practice change based on what we learned from the initial pilot. <clears throat> the pilot infant-driven feeding project was conducted in our level four NICU with the following methods. We had initial staff education and the evidence-based feeding practice, and we gave all of our staff six months to complete this online education. We created an interprofessional team. We designated infant driven feeding champions comprised of fed site nurses on both our day and our night shifts that assisted with educating our staff at the fed site of the new feeding practice. We created the electronic health record documentation with the infant driven feeding skills. We had the actual intervention of implementing the infant driven feeding practice. And then our pilot, our Infant driven feeding champions assisted us with re educating our staff throughout the duration of the project to promote sustainability of the new feeding practice. And we also created specific parent family education. The background um, on the infant driven feeding program is that it is a evidence based feeding practice that provides guidelines for feeding medically stable preterm infants. It is a semi-on-demand feeding protocol that is driven by the infant's behavior, assessed by the caregiver, and it's ordered by the advance provider. The actual implementation of IDF in our unit, as stated earlier, began with one infant uh, who was our pilot patient, and we monitored this patient for the first two weeks, monitoring this infant's oral feeding intake, daily, his daily weight gain, and his feeding quality scores. And then we conducted weekly chart audits on every patient who was on the IDF method over a three month period that assessed weekly patients for their weight gain, their IDF assessment scores, their time to achieve PO ad lib feedings, and their length of stay. No protected health information was collected for this quality improvement project. We began with an, uh, a budget for the project, uh, for all of the materials, all of the resources necessary for the mandatory staff education and the costs associated with that and uploading that, as well as all of the bedside reference infant driven feeding resources that were provided by Dr. Brown's medical that we made available for all of our staff. So our results, uh, from implementing infant driven feeding were that our pilot infants demonstrated sufficient daily weight gain while on infant driven feeding. The average time for our pilot infants to achieve PO ad lib feedings um, was about 15 days, really not significantly above uh, what we found in the literature for preterm infants who are learning to orally feed. We did a six month pre implementation baseline to get an average of the percentage of our patients that were on human milk in our unit. And with implementing infant driven feeding, we had 42% of our patients that were breastfeeding as their first PO feeding. Our percentage of human milk in the NICU increased to 75% for all of the infants who were on IDF. And then in terms of our length of stay, we saw uh, our pre-IDF baseline uh, for our infants for 33 weeks and above, a stay of about 26 days, which was four days above the local benchmark for California Perennial Quality Care Collaborative. We saw a slight decrease by about 1.3 days in length of stay for our infants who were feeding under the IDF model. So in analyzing our results 
after implementing infant-driven feeding, we saw that our pilot infants demonstrated adequate weight gain on IDF. Our use of human milk in the NICU increased 23% above our six-month pre-implementation baseline with infant-driven feeding. We didn't see a real significant decrease in the time to achieve full oral feedings. However, we did see our length of stay decrease by about 1.3 days for our target population for our infants who are 33 weeks and older. And then our oral feeding practice surveys that we gave to all of our nursing, OT, and lactation staff indicated a positive improvement in our unit for infant-driven feeding. The infant driven feeding implementation in our unit increased our lactation support for our NICU mothers, increased the use of human milk for all of our patients. We saw staff education successfully implemented of evidence-based feeding practice. We also saw successful interprofessional collaboration within the unit to implement infant-driven feeding. We had a decreased length of stay for our target population. Our unit feeding culture successfully transitioned to the infant-driven feeding practice. We also successfully incorporated IDF into our unit feeding policy and guidelines. And it's also worth uh, mentioning that we saw a significant increase of our patients being discharged home on human milk. Over 80% of our patients uh, with this initial pilot and presently are being discharged home on human milk as some part of their feeding regimen. So the recommendations um, going forward in our successful implementation of infant-driven feeding really have to do with promoting sustainability, and that's having IDF education as an annual mandatory competency for our staff, and additionally to expanding that education for our maternity and postpartum nurses. Um, specifically for the specific feeding difficulties of preterm infants. Per the literature, there is definitely a need for more targeted interventions to look into why premature infants continue to have feeding difficulties, even at term equivalent postmenstrual age. And further research is needed to empirically validate the infant-driven feeding method to continue to inform our feeding initiation practice for preterm infants. So that was our successful implementation of infant-driven feeding, and I'm proud to say that our unit has successfully transitioned into a feeding practice and culture that is safe, nurturing, and developmentally supportive for our infants. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Shelley. We appreciate your dedication to this project and your commitment to IDEA. Next up is Amanda Geringer, who's going to speak about a benefit that has not received a lot of attention in projects, reduced costs of supplies. Hello, my name is Amanda Geringer, and I am a NICU staff nurse at Sanford Children's Hospital in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I am here to present uh, impact of infant driven feeding on the cost of feeding supplies. I've been an RN in the NICU for about nine years. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Our level four NICU is located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota on the campus of Sanford USC Medical Center. We are a 58 bed unit with an average daily census of 40 patients. The infant driven feeding program was a purchase program uh, that included staff education and tools. It is a comprehensive neurodevelopmental approach to feeding that can produce a feeding culture change. It is if it is implemented appropriately. The IDF me method improves feeding efficiency by carefully monitoring and effectively intervening when stress cues are displayed. It has been suggested that IDF improves feeding acquisition and can shorten length of stay, but the impact on feeding supplies, uh, the cost of feeding supplies has not yet been recorded. So some background. IDF 
underlying concepts include infants can provide reliable cues to indicate readiness to feed. Infants can progress with feeding safety, safely and effectively when their cues are followed. And feeding beyond engagement is unsafe. The IDF program does require a financial investment and an ongoing commitment. We had a executive director in our organization request a study to determine the cost savings on feeding supplies after we had implemented the program to see if the cost of implementing the program offset the cost of feeding supplies. So our hypothesis was infants fed using the infant driven feeding model will have lower feeding supply costs than infants fed with the, a provider driven feeding order. The goal was to document savings on feeding supplies. And we had two, core, two cohorts and the, we did a retrospective study. So our two core cohorts were uh, the provider driven feeding or the infant driven feeding. And we did two retrospective eight month studies. Um, the provider driven feeding study was February, September of 2017. And the infant driven feeding was February to September of 2018. The feeding supplies were NGs and feeding extension tubings and syringes. So the data sources were our supply chain report that gave us the cost of the feeding supplies and we were able to determine the length of stay and the gestational age of each patient from our patient census dashboard, but we did not directly access the individual medical records for specific patient information. So if you look at our two cohorts here, the provider driven feeding infants were a little bit older actually, so 36 and 0.6 for gestational age where the infant driven feeding were 36.5. The provider driven feeding average monthly cost for feeding supplies was 4,600 and the infant driven feeding was 3,600. So the total savings for infant driven feeding for uh, feeding supplies was about $980. So the total in that eight month period of the study was $7,845. And we also determined that the length of stay was shorter for the infant driven feeding infants by about a day, which that cost really adds up quickly as well. So there were 1,858 fewer patient days and it impacted the unit census by six patients per day. And this is a huge impact for budget, nurse satisfaction, and for staffing purposes. The implementation of IDF requires a culture shift, um, medical record alignment, physician champions to ensure the success of IDF. And uh, you need an ongoing investment for continuing education and training. So to conclude, IDF has reduced the cost of feeding supplies in our unit. The cost savings did offset the expense of the training and infants in the infant driven feeding cohort had a shorter length of stay, which has a clinical significance. Limitations include that this was just one small focus study in one unit and um, we had only one indicator of severity of illness, which was gestational age. And there was an assumption that the cohorts were equal and it was only a short time period. The eight months was only a very short time period. And we did not validate any of the information with the medical record data because of the request by our executive director. So looking for practice in the future for nursing, it impacts 
the nurse and patient workload and it impacts the quality of, of time spent with the infant. It should decrease readmission rates for late feeding failures and should help increase breastfeeding rates and decrease surgical G-tube placement. For financial disclosure, there was no funding received for this project. And we, the facility, purchased a licensed commercial product in order to implement IDF. These are my contributors for my clinical nurse specialist, my developmental specialist, and my manager in my unit. Thanks, Amanda. And Amanda's team has a published article about their experience, which you'll be able to find in the reference list that you'll receive after this webinar. Last but not least is Renee Bloom to talk about her hospital's brand new study on IDF. Thank you, Lisa. Um, just to reiterate, my name is Renee Bloom. I'm an RN unit supervisor in a level three NICU um, at Inova Fair Oaks Hospital in Northern Virginia. Um, our NICU just completed this study. It's called the Effect of Infant Driven Feeding on Long-Term uh, Feeding Success and NICU Length of Stay. Um, it's the first longitudinal IDF study completed at this time. Um, I am the principal investigator for the study, along with an incredible team that I will introduce shortly. Um, before we delve into the study, I want to give you a little bit of background and our motivation for our study. As I said, we're a level three NICU. We admit uh, infants between 28 weeks gestation and above. So many years we have dedicated our attention to more critical issues such as neck, sepsis, IVH, um, et cetera. Um, but as technology and care practices improved our survival rates for our babies, we now can focus on ensuring our infants meet their potential outcomes beyond the walls of the NICU by maximizing the positive impact of our care and minimizing the negative. The De Developmental Care Committee at Inova Farrow's Hospital searched for a more developmentally appropriate and consistent feeding practice, which actually led us to IDF after being introduced to this model at a Gravens conference around 2013. Our initial motivation to change our feeding practice was definitely to be consistent in our feeding of preterm infants. When we learned that we were causing feeding issues after discharge due to our methods of feeding, well, that just solidified the need for us to change. It was eye-opening to understand that when the suck reflux disappeared around three months of age, that the infant could choose not to eat because of the negative wiring in the brain from un pleasant feeding experiences that had occurred in the NICU. As we gained insight into feeding abilities such as the suck swallow breathe pattern and actual cues from the infants, we decided that IDF, the IDF model was a perfect fit for our NICU population. When you know better, you do better. Um, these are some of the feeding problems that parents endured after discharge that were identified from traditional practice of feeding that motivated our NICU care team to, pers to persist in changing our culture. We had no idea that this was happening. These were in um, um, like it, uh, clinics after that our uh, parents would bring their baby back into um, that were showing that they were having true issues with um, getting their child to eat from um, avoidance behavior, vomiting, long term, long duration of meal times. They had low appetites. So once again, it just was we didn't want to cause these things for our babies and we had no idea that this was happening. So the motivation for us was very, very, very high. We took one year to fully educate our team prior to launching IDF. Um, we launched it January of 2016. We um, took the year to do the actual education for all our, our staff. We made a complete culture change in 2016 that included nurses, lactation consultants, OPTT, PT speech, ClinTex, neonatologists, and dietitians. Our parents obviously became part of our team as we move forward. I just want to share a quote from one of our mothers of an ex-28-weeker. 
at her two, two her, she sent this to me at her two year, her daughter's two year birthday. She said, I absolutely credit IDF with her success. I don't think she would have done nearly as well without. Honestly, it's hard to even think of what might have been our reality. She was a big, big um, proponent of IDF and um, really gave us a lot of extra clues into what we could do, especially with breastfeeding. After we implemented IDF and became aware of how much we improved our feeding practice, we decided to document this, hence the study. I have to say that our NICU staff would never go back to tr the traditional way of feeding. Um, this is really honestly the best change we've made in our NICU. We want to encourage other NICUs to implement IDF. Many of our nurses have floated to some of the other hospitals in our area that do not do IDF. Um, and it's been, you know, the feedback coming back when they come back to our unit is it's so extremely hard to go back to a traditional way of feeding. There's so many issues with babies crying that should be cue based. They're older, they, you know, don't need to be on a cue three hour feed and not being able to move forward with, um, you know, actually taking cues from the baby was very uh, disturbing to them. So, and then actually seeing people, you know, quote unquote, kind of force feed these babies. So it's just been a really good thing for us. Um, let me introduce you to our research team. This is an inter interdisciplinary research team that included physicians, nurses, OT, therapists, um, clinical nurse educators, statistician, and nursing research uh, scientists. They have been invaluable in making this research study come to fruition. I want to thank each and every one of them. It has been a labor of love because we really felt that the data would support implementation of IDF and support evidence-based knowledge of transforming premature infants from gabage feedings to oral feedings. The review of literature that we did prior to the study was, um, and you have to remember this was about 2015, so things might have changed, but this is what we're looking at as we introduce the study. At three months, the suck reflex disappeared, which we've discussed. Feeding problems common throughout childhood, avoidance, vomiting, coaxing of, of um, uh, you know, coaxing to eat at pre uh, were present during meals. Um, the use of rewards and oral motor dysfunction were seen. 30% of preterm infants are underweight in childhood. 52% of premature infants never experience breastfeeding in the NICU, which is just awful. Um, and uh, only 27% breastfed at discharge. There is a sharp decline in the rate of breastfeeding in the fir first few months of life after discharge. Um, skin to skin, we know improves breastfeeding rates and knowing Susan Ludwig's, you know, that she created IDF at the time was out there in our literature. The aim of our study was to compare um, different feeding practices at two ANOVA institutions. There's actually five, but only four with um, um, NICUs. So we had traditional, so they had not implemented IDF yet, and then ANOVA Fairfax Hospital, which did. Our hypothesis was <clears throat> that infant-driven feeding protocol in the NICU will result in more successful breastfeeding at discharge, shorter length of stay, shorter times to full feeds, and fewer feeding problems after discharge. Our measurements were, we had short-term and long-term goals. Our short-term were that the rate of breastfeeding at discharge would be improved with IDF, the gestational age at which full oral feeds were achieved would be better with IDF and like the stay would be improved with IDF. <clears throat> Our long-term were um, that they would have less feeding problems and our breastfeeding success rates at three and six and 12 months would be also improved. Our study design was non-randomized perspective study, longitudinal. 
our setting was we had a Nova Fair Oaks Hospital and a Nova Children's Hospital. <coughs> The duration of study was around 36 months, depending on when our last um, consent was. Parents will complete a survey at three, six, and 12 months after the babies were discharged from the NICU. Number of subjects were 99. There was 49 from the Inova Children's Hospital and 50 from Bear Oaks Hospital. We did get IRB approval. Um, the amendment to include children's, the children's hospital was because we initially had started with another community, a Nova community hospital that was similar to ours. Um, but when Fair, the Nova Children's Hospital decided they would go also participate, we switched to them because they had a higher population and we knew we would consent quicker. Um, so we had inclusion and exclusion criteria. The inclusion was um, basically the, uh, the gestational age between 28 and 33 and six weeks. They had to be born at that. We didn't bring them into it. If they were a 24 weeker, we did not enroll them. It, they had to be born at 28 weeks or be, between that and 33 and six. The exclusion was mostly surgical, anything that interfered with some type of thing that would skew our data from feeding from neck to, um, of, you know, um, any type of surgical heart disease. Um, we did have Spanish speaking, but we chose not to do a lot with um, other languages due to consents being having to be um, put into um, their languages. There would be too many. So we had Spanish and English, but we had many cultures. It was just they spoke English as well. Um, our study methods were to identify NICU admissions between the gestational age of 28 and 33 and six. Um, we had no experimental changes in our care. The Inova Children's Hospital were a traditional. We were already IDF. We just did what we normally did. Um, continue establishing feeding practices like I just said, informed consent prior to discharge. Um, data obtained via survey. Um, we followed them, we called them or sent them an email with the survey. At, we tried to always call first, um, but if we couldn't get a hold of them, we would send an email um, with the survey at three, six, and 12 months. And our control group was a Nova Children's Hospital. We started our enrollment August of 2019 for both. We ended in um, Fair Oaks Hospital in January. This means the last actual survey was completed, the 12 month survey. So it was January 25, um, 2022. And then Children's was March of 21. Um, the exciting thing is that we actually do have data that is being analyzed right at the moment, but it is not finalized. So unfortunately, I can't give you the actual um, um, statistician results, um, but they we're getting very close. We'll, we are going to pursue publishing, and it will be um, great for everyone to see what the results are. Um, we're seeing very promising results in many different areas. Um, breastfeeding results are amazing. And it was actually broken up into hospital after discharge and long term. So uh, this is so again promising IDF use it, it, the breastfeeding results are improved in the hospital as well as after discharge and long term. Um, length of stay was definitely improved. We're using IDF. Days to full feeds, again, improved using IDF. Earlier gestational age to full feeds, improved using IDF. And feeding problems were better with IDF, like we had less feeding problems in the hospital that used IDF versus the one that did not. So we're very excited. 
we can't wait to be able to share exactly everything we found out, but I honestly don't even have the actual results, and but they are coming soon. This was just our preliminary. Um, these are the references that are used. I know they're on the older side, but it was done at the origination of the study project in 2015. Um, we hope to add we hope to be added someday to the reference list as we publish our research data, so which would be very cool. Thank you so much. I hope that this was exciting for you as it has been for us. We are proud that we have accomplished this cultural change in our NICU. We want to support any positive impact in order to provide our vulnerable population with the best outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank Shelly, Amanda, and Renee for your efforts and also for providing this powerful information. Before we get into some benefits, um, I'm going to speak for just a couple minutes before Q&A, um, but I did take some notes because I wanted to highlight just a few things besides all the wonderful benefits about infant-driven feeding, but just things that really, really just struck me and I just can't, you know, be more excited about is Baby-friendly hospitals can do infant-driven feeding, and Shelly's um, team is um, a testimony to that. Um, sometimes we get comments that it's, IDF is too expensive to do for your whole unit, but as Amanda pointed out, the benefits completely outweigh um, and cover the cost. So at, you will save more than you will spend um, and save beyond that, as we've seen in other studies and um, just the length of stay and cost of supplies. Um, and then also from Renee, in addition to this amazing research that's coming, not just with in the hospital, but afterwards, and that babies are going to have better feeding experiences in the long run. But the parent quote just sticks in my head completely, right? Um, that it's great for babies, it's great for staff, but it is parents love this and that they can't imagine feeding their babies any other way. Um, and then, of course, how Renee said too, that her staff, the nurses say, they just would never go back, um, that they this has changed. And what's really interesting is we do evaluations when people take the infant-driven feeding program and nurses in one of the questions we ask is what would you do, what, what will you do differently now? And they all, the, <laughs> one of the most common comments is no more force feedings, I will pay more attention to baby's cues. And their testimonies of what they're gonna change just really is a testimony of how they have learned um, how to change, how to feed babies differently and in, in more improved positive feeding experiences. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so each of their own personal experiences while implementing the infant-driven feeding program in their NICU, of course, they've shown that they have the power of the program, how it benefits their, their infants. Um, other facilities have shown benefits through projects and studies to validate the program as well. So some of the benefits that we've seen, again, are reduced length of stay, decreased time to full oral feedings, increased breastfeeding rates, improved parent and staff satisfaction, reduced costs, increased skin to skin time, and a greater nursing understanding of feeding cues and responses. And even if some of these weren't mentioned today, um, either through other QI projects or published studies, um, these, these um, results have been documented and that resource list I'm gonna send you in a couple of days, we'll provide that information as well. So I wanted to just, before we go into QA, just talk real quickly about this study that just came out about infant-driven feeding in the literature. I think it was in Advances in Neonatal Care <clears throat> um, just let this, this past month. So uh, this study evaluated a change in NICU nurses' knowledge, perceptions, and feeding practices and culture following education and implementation of the IDF protocol. So this was a 36 bed level three NICU. They initially surveyed 120 nurses. <clears throat> Their final number was 39 because they did this pre-survey, post-survey, and they had to get all the people to do the pre, all the people to do the post. But then the num final number is people who ended up doing both. So they did end up with 39. Um, and the survey that they used was the oral feeding survey and included questions uh, concerning oral feeding preparation strategies and it required the responders to identify the frequency with which they use specific criteria to begin oral feeding attempts and then also to decrease oral feeding attempts. So their education portion was a 30 minute PowerPoint um, during mandatory education sessions, but then all staff completed the infant driven feeding online program. 
And in addition, they really spoke to other strategies that they use to support practice change, such as peer support, mentors, audit strategies. So their results, the post-implementation survey responses were significant for these. Fewer, and I'm going to talk to a couple of them because a couple of them are like, you're like, what? This doesn't really seem right. But fewer nurses making decisions to begin oral feedings, um, increased use of gestational age to increase frequency of oral feeding attempts, less reliance on weight loss to decrease feeding attempts, increase in combination interventions to prepare infants for oral feeding, and a greater willingness to allow for a rest period. Again, that one speaks to, to when I said that nurses in our survey say they no longer force babies, they stop feeding you know, um, at a better appropriate more time. Um, so this comment about fewer nurses making decisions to begin uh, oral, oral feedings, they hypothesize that, that I know that seems a little strange, but they say that could have been due to the fact that between the pre-survey and the post-survey, the feeding specialist and dietitian were newly involved in the decision-making process. So it was more of a team approach. So it wasn't just nurses making decisions. And they wrote in, the, in this article that there was some ambiguity in how that question was worded. So they said they weren't specifically identified in, as separate choices. So, And then in regards to the gestational age between pre and post, the authors noted that in survey one and survey two, the unit actually instituted a minimum gestational age for oral feedings um, to go along with infant-driven feeding so that they weren't feeding babies, um, offering battles at 30 weeks. So the study concludes that the, um, these differences indicate that it's a, a greater understanding of infant feeding cues and appropriate responses to them, and also that their findings reflect a change in the feeding culture and practice that is consistent with other evidence-based oral feedings. And this nerving behavior study is, is, is significant in that it demonstrates that IDF really does create practice change in the NICU. So this leads us to probably the most important factor, of course, reduced costs, uh, length of stay. These are amazing benefits, but remember it's really about the infants in our care. So imagine if we move away from a stressful and unpleasant feedings, imagine a NICU where infants are listened to, feedings begin when infants are ready, the caregivers astutely watch and watch the infant cues, they respond appropriately, feedings are stopped when the infant says so, whether breast or bottle, feedings are positive, nurturing, safe, developmentally appropriate, care is consistent. With IDF, you too can change your feeding culture. We can work together to change feeding practice one NICU at a time. So I just also wanna mention that the Infant Driven Feeding Program is a copyrighted program. The program and scales are, are copyrighted works owned by Handicraft Company and the contents are for single user access, not for any other purposes. The scales may be not modified in any other way other than resizing. They're not to be used or shared with others who have not completed the program with individualized purchase license and that written permission requires is required to add scales to your EMR and for any manuscript or poster recognition. So where do you start? You can contest it, contact us today at medinfo at drbrownsmedical.com or um, you can go to our website at www.drbrownsmedical.com. You can also reach out to our account managers or anyone on our team. And now I just want to take some time for some questions. All right. Does anyone have some questions? Let's see. Thank you, thank you. Our presenters are gonna come back on. So I want to, I first have a question. Remember, if you had a specific question for Shelly, you can email them to me and she will um, get back to us with those. I'll, I'll get them to you all. Um, if you could, let's see, Amanda, you mentioned that uh, IDF requires provider support. Do you have any tips on how to get that provider support from your staff? I feel like that if you present the evidence um, and you kind of show your um, medical team, like, everywhere else is having such great uh, benefits from this. And that really helps because 
most medical professionals are very um, ha have had a lot of research and evidence based kind of drilled into them. So I think that if you don't just say like we want to try this, if you kind of present some of the background information, that usually really helps. All right, I mean, or Renee, do you have anything else to add about that? How did you, your unit um, work with that with provider support? Well, you know, bringing back, um, well, number one, our unit had an interest in changing how we fed babies anyway. We were looking at cue based feedings and we needed kind of a pathway. So um, when we presented the actual, the 2007 article that Susan Ludwig and um, Karen um, uh, wrote, it uh, seemed like it was a great pathway towards changing our culture. Um, but then it was like, seriously, one step at a time, I had to get the NEOs, you know, input into it. Then I had to get my director's input into it and, um, and back up for it. And we just kept pursuing that this is, and we were a group, we we're a developmental care committee and the committee really wanted this change and we were willing to do the work behind it. Um, so we just kept pursuing how it would be uh, um, important for our unit. And um, we got foundation money to buy the licenses. You know, we just kept going until um, we got what we wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I know that just from talking to other people too, um, you know, the more research you can provide. So now we're here to help you. And the re research, as you can see, as everyone here can see, it just keeps piling up. So um, thankfully people are, are finding that we have great results with IDF. Um, the other thing is Dr. Brown's Medical does have a provider support um, webinar. It's uh, it's about a 45 minute video you can access through our website. You know, I mean, ideally we want them to take the whole program, but um, in the beginning, even to get them maybe on board, they can do the Dr. Brown's um, provider support video. Um, and I don't know if any of you shared that with your team in the beginning, but um, that can be a huge success too. Calling other NEOs. Um, you know, we do have some neonatologists who have said, yes, you can give my information to other neonatologists looking at infant-driven feeding. So um, we have provided, we have been given permission to, for a few of those, but I, I mean, and then that's a great way also to talk neo to neo, right? Um, so I think that that can be very helpful or provider to provider. So thank you. Um, what about biggest challenge? Everybody wants to know the biggest challenge always. And whoever wants to speak, if you, you know. So our biggest great. challenge was really um, the breastfeeding component was once we kind of followed, you know, the scales and that kind of stuff and got our order sets kind of down where everyone could follow and, um, the order sets that matched all the scales, right? It was the breastfeeding was definitely the hardest thing. And it took us a really, probably a good year to really fine tune our supplementation and understanding, um, you know, even though we had the guidelines to supplement, you had to really hone in on, were they transferring milk when they sucked, if they were weak or if mom produced enough milk or, you know, there was a lot of components to it. And I know now that you have the breastfeeding module that's out, correct? Yeah. yeah which I think yep. is going to be a big help for people starting. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, I will say that just in reading, you know, uh, so for those of you that don't know, we did add a chapter eight breastfeeding um, success to our infant driven feeding program. And I, IDF has always been, you know, inclusive and very supportive of breastfeeding. Obviously these hospitals did the, did the infant driven feeding program before we introduced it, but um we wanted to provide even more support. And that was the number one question we would get in our vows is more on breastfeeding, more on breastfeeding. Cause it is, you're right, Renee. It's like one of the hardest things um, in the NICU. So our early evaluations already are, is that this is extremely helpful. And we would love for even, you know, to see now, uh, you know, take the, you know, here's another topic for you, Renee, <laughs> take, have your nurses do that section and see if your rates go up even more. So um, do a QI study on that, but yes, breastfeeding is a huge challenge. Um, Amanda, what do you think your biggest challenge was? I think the culture shift of, um, you know, especially some of the older nurses that were, you know, I can feed a rock kind of, um, attitude. 
and just it really took some time um and um our speech therapy team was really uh a big part of being like reiterating the information at our um, quarterly meetings and being like, you know, we need to be safe. We need to follow the cues. Um, and then going through the actual training, I think really helped with that as well too, because it's not just about volume. It's about, or not about quality, quantity of the feeding. It's about the quality of the feeding more than anything. So I think that was probably our biggest yeah. um, challenge was that culture shift for the nurses to be like, oh yes, it is about quality. It's not about, you know, getting them to take the full bottle. Yeah. Um, well, that's funny because that was the question. One of the questions that's coming in is what about the tenured nurse who's always done it this way, doesn't want to change? Um, I think too, I mean, Renee, you kind of touched on it. Uh, when, 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 I'm, when I was at one of my mm -hmm. hospitals, what I required of our, I mean, not required, that sounds really strong, but what, what we really wanted our nurses to do was to have a rotation in developmental follow-up clinic because they don't get to see that, right? So they don't see what these babies look like, um, three months out, six months out. And you touched on that is that once you actually saw that you were like, oh my gosh, what can we change about our feeding? Because we got to do something, Right. And so I think that that is, could be a nice component to add is, you know, when you're training your nurses or when you're having a skills day or something, can you have some type of information from developmental fall clinic or something that um, there used to be a video from feeding matters that we would show um, in some of our skills days too, but um, it's that older nurse, but I will tell you too, I like to talk about our evals, but I'll, you know, a large portion of the people who take IDF are nurses with 15 to 20 years of experience. They rate it really nicely. They mm -hmm. still learn things and they say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to change the way I feed babies even after 50 to 20 years. So it's not true that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can't. So um, uh, somebody said, how long is the updated IDF module? The breastfeeding um, a chapter is about 20 minutes, um, 20 minutes long. So it's not um, super long. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, um, Amanda, you spoke that, um, how, how I'm reading this because it relates to something in your PowerPoint, but how do you handle staffing? So you mentioned that one of the benefits is it's improved staffing, but yet the question, this question, and we also get this question a lot is, um, if we're paying attention to cues and we're really not doing, you know, very strict schedules, but we're moving towards an infant driven feeding, how people will say that's much, much harder to staff. So what do you do in the days where we're all short nurses and, um, schedules are hard and we're, you know, nurses are kind of struggling with that, um, during these times. So what do you think about staffing? I actually think you, spend less time with the like how to how to phrase um i think the time that you're spending with your babies with the idf is more uh is better quality versus um you're sitting and trying to bottle this baby for 25 minutes and they're just asleep uh so i think it's not um i don't think it really changes too much uh on the time this difference but I think it's really important in educating the family and how important it is for them to be there with, with their babies as much as they can. Um, well, we have like our speech therapist for like our late preterm babies. She'll actually come and do an IDF presentation about cues and um, pacing and everything with the baby, with the, with the parent before they actually start eating. So that's actually really helpful. And ultimately, you know, it doesn't really matter how the baby feeds for us because we're not gonna be the ones taking them home. So I think that's a really important to communicate with the family on the discharge plan and making sure that they're the ones that are comfortable feeding because ultimately they're the ones that have to feed that baby yeah. at home, not us. So Amen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else you wanna add Renee? Well, I think for us, the um, time consuming part is definitely at the beginning as you're educating the family um about idf and um you know doing a partial bottle and then having to still put up a feeding and it is time consuming i think at the beginning 
Um, but I think the reward is towards the end when the parent is really self-sufficient, they know how to pace a the baby, they know how to side feed, the, you know, the whole, then they're doing the complete feed themselves without you. So on the end of it, on the other end of it, you're getting your time, you know, back. And it's, so it's just really putting the time up front mm-hmm. with education and <clears throat> with yeah. the families. So, yeah. And I also want to add, you know, even it's, it's kind of the same concept with developmental care. When we started talking more about responding to the baby's cues and taking more time to do your nursing assessments. But if you spend more time and, and for example, take longer and let the baby, you know, have some time you might take more time doing that one specific care, but in the long run, it's going to take less time because you're not going to have a stressed baby who's, who's desatting and having heart rate drops, and you're not going to have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. And that's true about feeding too. So, Mm -hmm. um, this last question, because we are running out of time is a super quick answer. Somebody said breastfeeding is a big hurdle. Does the program recommend pre and post weights or use a timing at breastfed breast method to determine supplementation amounts amounts? Um, IDF does have a breastfeeding algorithm, um, in addition, um, you know, and, and especially in the beginning, not to get so hung up on pre and post weights, but a little bit of a combination of both, but there is a breastfeeding algorithm that helps with that. And I know Renee, you, I know you specifically, we've talked about this, that your hospital used that a lot as well. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you all for being here and any questions that don't get answered again, we will answer them. They will be posted in a handout on our website. You will all receive a no CUs for this presentation, but you will all receive an evaluation and then you will get handouts and reference lists. It will be posted on our website, the recording, um, in about two weeks and in January. Um, we are going to have a rebroadcast of this with another Q&A time. Um, So we will be providing all of that for you um, as well. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.